Alrighty there, economics pilgrims. So you want to learn a little bit about taxes and elasticity. Here you go. This is the first of two tutorials about taxes. The first one deals with elasticity. The second one will deal with dead weight loss. So to situate the question here, we are looking at elasticity primarily because we want to know the question, if a new tax is implemented on something, who really pays it? If the tax is implemented on the sellers, does it mean the seller will pay it all? Is it implemented on the buyers? Will the buyer pay it all? Both of those answers are strikingly no. And the reason that you want to understand this is to save yourself from the embarrassment of being this guy, misunderstanding tax policy, voting for the wrong people, totally getting it wrong. His stance is that this new two dollar per tax per per pack cigarette tax this guy is about to implement or is planning to implement is going to make his cigarettes two dollars more expensive this is patently false we'll show you why just to remind you economics is not all abstract in fact most of its most interesting applications are in real life policy dilemmas and fights All right, so the nuts and bolts of graphing taxes. Now, it doesn't really matter who is charged formally with a tax. It could be the buyers, it could be the sellers. The outcome is going to be the same. If you've got a tax that's forty dollars, notice that we've um, that price is on the vertical axis here, so we can measure everything on the vertical vertical axis in dollars, just like the tax. So, a tax of forty dollars. We'll put a distance of $40 between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives. It's called the tax wedge. And interestingly, it means that both buyer and seller share the pain of the tax. The actual incidence of the tax falls on both buyer and seller. How do we know this? Because if you compare the new situation to the equilibrium price, you'll find that the equilibrium price used to be $80. The buyers, which who are paying $40 more than the sellers, are now paying $100. Find this by looking at the demand curve, the top of this tax wedge here. And $40 below them are the sellers. So the buyers pay $20 more than they used to, and the sellers receive $20 less than they used to. This happens to be split exactly 50-50. The pain is not necessarily always split 50-50 between buyers and sellers. Here's a practice question for you. Take a minute to answer. Yeah. And here comes the answer. So if you are looking for a tax, you want to look at the vertical distance between the buyer and the seller price. In this case, 25 minus 15, $10. And here's some applications of different elasticities. So if you have buyers that are really addicted to a product like gasoline, can't change their consumption, don't want to change their consumption, we'd call them inelastic. And you notice the steepness of the demand curve shows you that, that consumers are really not very sensitive to prices. Very different than the suppliers in this case who are um, have a flat supply curve. Their quantity response to every price change is much larger. So if you implement a tax on this situation with a uh, one side markedly more elastic than the others, you'll find that the burden is not shared equally. It is, in fact, split still, but in this case, the pain is skewed much more towards the buyer. How do we know? We look at the equilibrium price, which was $2 before the tax. After the tax, top of the tax wedge, buyers are paying $2.95 bottom of the tax wedge, sellers are receiving $195. Although both sides are hurt in buyers paying more, sellers receiving less than before, clearly the buyers are the ones most mostly hurt here. And that's the technical explanation. If you're looking for an intuitive or logical explanation, it would go something like this. The sellers realize that they can jack the price up, pass along most of that increased cost, and buyers will continue to buy the same amount. So basically, you're going to find that whichever side is more elastic, in this case suppliers, 
we'll be able to escape the tack. So elastic equals escape. Here's an alternate example where, in this case, the demanders are the ones that are more price sensitive. Notice the flatness of the demand curve. Elastic is the response. Every time price changes a little bit, quantity demanded changes by a lot. And so we see that demanders have a more elastic demand curve than the suppliers do because the demand curve is flatter. So you levy a tax here, and you're going to find the tax is still split, but the equilibrium price of six dollars is going to turn into a price for buyers of six fifty, a little bit more than before, but a price of one fifty for the sellers, a lot less than before. So the sellers, the less elastic of the two, are going to be hurt more. Again, elastic e equals escape. In this case, that's for the demand. How does this look intuitively? Well, this exact scenario played out in 1990 when the U.S. government launched a new tax on yachts. Yacht buyers moved on to other products. They were sensitive to price, but yacht boat builders could not move to other types of production. So what happened was buyers bought a lot less than before, and sellers to try to protect at least some amount of sales had to drop their price quite substantially. And finally, an application for you in policy. So if we were to tax junk food, what's going to happen? If we want our tax to do um, what it's intended to do, to deter people from actually eating junk food, would you rather have your demand curve be inelastic or elastic? And by now, hopefully, you're attracted to the second of the two. The elastic buyers or sellers, in this case it's buyers, will be very sensitive to the price and will adjust their quantity. So putting a tax on junk food will create a lot lower sales for junk food if the demand is elastic.